Federico Rinaldi, who is um, an archaeologist, uh, who is also then specializing in restauri monumenti, Facoltà di Architettura dell'Università della Sapienza. Um, and that should be at Roma 3. And basically his tesi is on the history of the restoration and conservation of Ostia Antica. And uh, as of 2001, uh, the project of the maintenance of Ostia uh, has been uh, entrusted to a company called Ales, which is a società with, a, um, with an alliance with the Ministry of Beni Culturali. And um, so he's been involved in Ostia for quite some time. And he will present then giving a historical overview of uh, basically the history of excavation and ultimately the, the conservation efforts um, regarding that. Good afternoon to everyone. With this paper, which is a synthesis of our work, I hope to provide an overview of the situation at Ostia Antica by seeking to communicate the extraordinary value of this patrimony with the fewest words possible as well as a few reflections on the manner in which this patrimony has reached us here today, a very brief glance at the macroscopic conservation problems that afflict the site and what we are attempting to do about them. I'm putting a lot of meat on the fire, so to speak, but I will be as brief as possible, nevertheless emphasizing that these are topics deserving much more detailed treatment. Ostia represents one of the most important sites of the Italian archaeological patrimony, and it has come to us via a rather complicated history of excavations, restoration and consolidation work, and maintenance. When we talk about Ostia, we are talking about an urban context of the High Imperial period, which has no parallels among other archaeological sites in Italy. Ostia can be described as an indispensable source of documentation for the architecture and urban development of Rome itself. This is because Ostia, unlike Rome, was gradually abandoned in late antiquity and ceased to be a settlement. This situation created the conditions for the survival of a multi-stratified site which documents the evolution of architecture and building in Rome itself, which shared materials, skills, architects, and building techniques and types with Ostia. In other words, Ostia gives us what not even the Vesuvian cities like Herculaneum and Pompeii can give us, because these cities are located geographically far from the imperial capital and chronologically prior to that social and urban dynamism of the High Empire, which provides the ultimate origins of modern life. Ostia began in the 4th century BC as a Roman military outpost at the mouth of the Tiber River with a twofold purpose, to control the extraction and sale of salt and to establish contact with the dominant powers of the Mediterranean, the Greeks and the Carthaginians. This initial strategic military function evolved rapidly in the following centuries. In the imperial period, Ostia's role became that of the center of administration, management and organization of Rome's extremely complex but at the same time highly efficient port system, which was composed of three elements. The maritime segment consisting of Ostia and, to the north, Portus, the largest and most important port city of antiquity, the Tiber River, which was lined with a series of specialized docking facilities, and the urban docks of the capital. The functioning of this enormous machine depended on the efficiency of each of these individual elements. In particular, Ostia's role was to facilitate the commercial flow of raw materials and foodstuffs from around the Mediterranean, especially grain, the main ingredient of the Roman diet, which Rome imported almost exclusively from the eastern provinces, most importantly Egypt. The slide behind me is an aerial image of the theater. The public square in front of it preserves an extremely important figurative text on ancient commerce, approximately 60 mosaics which bear scenes of port activity and mention some of the largest private entrepreneurial associations to which a very powerful Roman magistrate, the Praefectus Annonae, contracted out the purchase, transport and distribution of the merchandise.
In the second century AD, Ostia underwent a true architectural revolution. The city was gradually reconstructed under the emperors Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. Entire sectors of the city were subjected to grandiose renewal projects with the construction of enormous public buildings such as the Capitolium, the largest temple in the city, large bath complexes, some of which, like the forum baths, distinguished by ingenious technical features, like the arrangement of the heated rooms along a diagonal line to prevent these enormous masses from blocking each other's access to sunlight, therefore allowing the sun's rays to contribute to the maintenance of the desired temperature. And above all, large warehouse structures which are distinguished by certain technological features such as hollow spaces beneath the floors that promoted the necessary circulation of air to prevent spoilage of the perishable materials stored there. Ostia is distinguished especially by its insulae, or densely populated residential structures, of which it provides without doubt the most important examples anywhere in the Roman world. Besides the multi-story insulae, Ostia preserves examples of strikingly modern types of residential construction such as the garden houses complex that we will visit tomorrow, which incorporates private gardens into the plan. The refinement of construction in this era is evident in the preserved structural decorations. In some cases, even the ceiling decorations are intact. and in the mosaics, such as this very important polychrome mosaic in the house of the Dioscuri. As I mentioned earlier, this patrimony has reached us via a rather complex history. The plan behind me shows the excavated area, approximately 32 hectares in extent, which is about two-thirds of the estimated built-up area within the late Republican fortification walls visible in the plan. The first scientific excavations began in the second half of the 19th century, when the situation at Ostia was completely different. Very few structures had been revealed, and from that moment on, i.e. starting with the state-sponsored excavations of Pietro Rosa and the later campaigns of Rodolfo Lanciani, these were used to reconstruct the topography of ancient Ostia. This is a turn-of-the-century image of the so-called portico of Pius IX, a multi-use complex built to very high standards. In the background, the last bend in the Tiber is visible, elegantly summarizing the intimate relationship between the city and the river which was so essential for the life of Ostia. The first efforts of conservation and restoration also began at this time. Research on these efforts has only just begun. They are extremely hard to describe because very poorly documented, and above all, these 19th century restorations have been modified many times in the intervening decades. Indirect clues can occasionally be found in photographs like this one from the turn of the century taken by Thomas Ashby, which shows external buttresses that are detached from the architecture that they were designed to support. In this case, the thrust of the roofs corresponding to the last preserved rooms on these remarkable upper floors. There is also direct evidence, such as restorations performed with materials recovered on the site, in other words, repairs of a mimetic nature. This period saw the production of the best mortars ever used in restoration at Ostia. These mortars were made with traditional materials and mixed using traditional methods. We know that the lime was brought to Ostia in the form of calcium oxide, in other words, as lumps of quicklime, cooled in open-air pits, and then employed after several months of seasoning. The mortar was mixed on the spot with volcanic sand using the special tool shown here. The result was practically identical in consistency to ancient mortars. In fact, even today they are extremely difficult to distinguish. In this case, the discriminating feature is the color of the volcanic sand, 
which is red in the restoration mortar rather than black as in the original mortar. The history of restoration at Ostia is important because, among other things, it documents the different cultural approaches of the people who directed the excavations over the course of decades. For example, under the direction of Dante Valieri and Roberto Paribeni, following inspiration from Giacomo Boni and Gustavo Giovannoni, repairs were made to be somewhat distinguishable. Ancient bricks recovered in the excavations continued to be used in repairs because this was by far the most economic method. The repairs were differentiated from the original structures via cues such as claw marks or parallel incisions in the bricks. But Ostia is also, and especially, the land of mimetic repairs. Starting under the direction of Guido Calza, these distinctive techniques were gradually abandoned in favor of purely mimetic repairs lacking distinctive characteristics. Calza believed that, in aesthetic terms, no repair was good enough to fool an expert eye. He was probably right. But today, nearly a century later, with the inevitable alterations to the materials and mortars caused by chemical, physical and mechanical agents, I can assure you that in some cases it is extremely difficult to distinguish the original construction from the modern repairs. Regarding the protection of the tops of walls, which is still today one of the most common types of repairs to the excavated structures, we see that back then, as now, there were basically two approaches in use. At top, the spreading of hydraulic cement, a mixture of volcanic sand and different sizes of crushed brick aggregate, which was then packed down to increase its mechanical resistance, and the various methods shown at bottom, that attempted to a greater or lesser degree to imitate the core of a wall by sticking into the mortar materials recovered on site such as brick or tufo. The activities of excavation and restoration were simultaneous. This is an image of the second floor of a residential structure that we will visit tomorrow. It is clear that during the excavation, while they were digging down on the inside, they immediately reset in place the collapsed sections. This system created an enormous savings in the economy of the restoration work. The replacement of the collapsed sections was accomplished with simple hoists mounted on wooden platforms. Ostia is also the scene of several important construction projects which were heavily criticized after the Second World War, but today are being reconsidered. Perhaps the most important project in scientific and technical terms is this one at the Insula of Diana. The excavation and restoration of this complex revealed a type of building, namely the multi-story residential insula, which had been up to that moment completely unknown. The project was supervised by Italo Gismondi, one of the most important figures in 20th century scholarship on ancient architecture, and in certain ways had a direct influence on contemporary structures. Like this building designed by Innocenzo Sabatini in the Roman suburb of Carpatella, which bears an exact copy of the balcony of the Insula of Diana, discovered just a few years before. A critical moment in the history of the city, and one with consequences that we are still paying today, was the large-scale excavation carried out between 1938 and 1942, when Ostia was inserted into the master plan for the Rome World's Fair of 1942, a World's Fair which never came to pass because of the Second World War. Ostia offered the possibility of showing off a nearly complete Roman city. The work that was carried out in less than four years, actually in three and a half, was dramatic, as is evident in the plan behind me, the area in purple. In less than four years, an area of approximately 19.5 hectares was excavated, 
more than had been excavated and restored much more slowly and carefully in the preceding 60 to 70 years. Some statistics help communicate the scale of this enterprise. The discoveries included more than four kilometers of streets, more than 10,000 square meters of residential structures, and approximately 300 new mosaics. It is difficult to quantify the mass of material we have inherited from this activity. More importantly, the outbreak of the war made it impossible to finish the restorations. Besides the walls, rather heavy-handed restoration was performed on the decorative elements. The mosaics were lifted and mounted on reinforced cement structures. On the left is the mosaic in the Insula of the Muses, on the right a marble pavement in the house of Cupid and Psyche that was also lifted in order to insert a waterproofing layer designed to offer protection from the rising moisture. The same technique was used on paintings which were first cut at the bases of the walls and then into these cuts were inserted the waterproofing materials, lead, sheets or asphalt. Not long after, by the late 1950s, when it had become clear that these techniques were not effective, the frescoes were lifted and replaced on reinforced cement structures. This is the result of those attempts at conservation. Oxidation of the iron framework and peeling of the ancient materials. The same holds true for the mosaics, where the exposed iron bars have rusted and swollen in volume. So what has happened since the end of the Second World War? In essence, there has been a general abuse of concrete at Ostia. The utopia of the so-called definitive restoration led to the widespread application of extremely rigid mortars that were chemically, physically and mechanically incompatible with the ancient materials. The exposed structures were subjected to processes that were almost industrial in nature, with the global repair of essentially all gaps in the walls and the creation of these wall caps in cement, which today show their total inefficiency, especially where they are subjected to external mechanical forces, such as accidental impacts or the stresses of the rampant vegetation. These caps behave as if they were monolithic. Either they snap and fall, or they stay in place while the walls they were meant to protect disintegrate beneath them. The phenomenon is even more obvious in the most fragile structures. Here only the protective cement lining is left. The ancient materials have been entirely lost. A few notes on the current processes of degradation. Obviously, like all open-air archaeological sites, Ostia presents enormous challenges in conservation associated with exposure to atmospheric agents and touristic activity. But, like all archaeological sites, it has specific environmental conditions that result in particular processes of degradation. Our current state of knowledge about these processes, and especially the dynamics of their evolution, is fragmentary and needs a great deal of detailed research. In macroscopic terms, one of Ostia's worst afflictions is the rampant vegetation. On this photograph taken at the end of the 1990s is superimposed a graphic of the rampant vegetation. Due to favorable climatic conditions and the total lack of containment, by the end of the 1990s about two-thirds of the site was obscured by vegetation, especially ivy, briar, wild ficus and bay. On the ground, the gravity of the situation is all the more evident. 
with undesired effects, in particular a drastic reduction in the site's accessibility. The study of archival photographs and aerial photographs has allowed us to verify that ivy was introduced into the site before the end of the 1930s, probably intentionally, in order to create a romantic atmosphere. The situation began to get out of control in the 1970s when efforts to contain the growth were abandoned. Since then, the ivy has overtaken all of the other plants. The very serious forms of damage caused by the presence of the rampant vegetation include widespread mechanical failures, with partial or total separation of wall surfaces, as well as, unfortunately, structural failures caused by stresses that set off processes of movement, rotation, and in some cases even complete inversion of individual wall segments. Another macroscopic problem at Ostia is the underlying structural geology. The soil at Ostia is composed primarily of clay and sand with water channels interspersed just below the surface. The annual seasonal fluctuation in the level of the water table normally exceeds one meter. Yet another enormous problem is the poor drainage of the soil. Comparison of images of the same buildings taken in the previous century and in recent years shows that in particularly wet periods, the rainwater forms pools that can persist for up to six or seven months, and the stagnant water is eventually eliminated only by evaporation. The very evident damage caused by rising moisture at Ostia is aided by the use of porous materials. Resulting in a capillary rise of moisture and the formation of soluble salts. These are year-round processes, most apparent in the winter, with the appearance of these salt blooms. But the same processes are also present in the summer, when the salts crystallize inside the structures due to the very high temperatures and stronger winds, resulting in blooms that cause even greater damage because they put direct stress on the materials. The materials that are most affected by these degradation processes are clearly the weakest ones. First and foremost, tufo. And we have noted in some cases the presence of artificial ledges where the rise of the moisture stops and wind erosion is active, with consequent reduction of the wall height by up to one-third in the worst cases. This is a phenomenon that should be monitored. Other enormous problems are associated with biological degradation. Very high levels of relative humidity favor the presence and formation of algae, lichens, and fungi that often render many Austin mosaics practically invisible. Another phenomenon marked by a rapid spread over the last 20 years is the degradation caused by bird droppings. And then there are the problems common to all archaeological sites associated with touristic activity, very often involving inappropriate uses of the ancient structures. For almost 10 years now, we have been working on a maintenance program amidst the many difficulties inherent in the archaeological site of Ostia. The project is run by Ales, a company with a single client, the Italian Ministry of Culture. From the start, the project has included a correction phase and a maintenance phase. The correction phase involves the defoliation and the recuperation of the greatest possible number of accessible areas based on their state of conservation. The objective of the maintenance phase is to create the conditions for the sustainable accessibility of this area via the institution of activities aimed at containing the regrowth of the vegetation protecting the decorative elements, implementing protective structures along the most popular visitor routes, and cleaning the archaeological site, a very humble but nevertheless fundamental activity. Last but not least, the project calls for continuous monitoring and documentation of the work performed.
l'interpretazione della poesia. During the defoliation stage, we aim to calibrate the action to the specific state of conservation of the structures and to their specific repair histories. We try to preserve to the greatest extent possible the integrity of the structures and the environmental context, removing the vegetation first with chemical treatments of very low toxicity, then very cautiously by hand. These are before and after images of the defoliation process. Here we are on Via della Foce. This is a bread-making facility, the largest production facility in Ostia. And this is the first example of mass-produced residential structure, the so-called model houses, which had not been visible for 30 years. These images show several phases of the defoliating chemical treatments, and these show the manual removal of the vegetation once it is dry. These are highly risky activities because they can cause severe damage to the structures, and so they must be performed with the greatest possible prudence. In certain cases, this prudence has allowed us to preserve wall caps created in the last century, as in the image at bottom right. The upper image shows the current state after 10 years of activity. In yellow are all the areas where the vegetation has been removed, in green the areas still obscured. In the lower image, the red line indicates all of the structure is repaired in great haste during the work associated with the World's Fair of 1942 or retouched in the 1960s that suffer from advanced degradation and require very precisely defined intervention since these are structures that have been barely touched and therefore preserve their full historical documentary value. For this reason, the projects of direct conservation that we have been performing over the years are limited to the infilling of walls or plastering of cracks in very small extents. In some cases, we have repaired the old wall caps. In other areas, where the superintendency has asked us to prepare new cappings, we have attempted to imitate the fabric or matrix of the walls. This is an example of maintenance of a building afflicted by man-made problems. This is the Capitolium, which is literally assaulted every year by the approximately 300,000 people who visit Ostia. Recently, the stairway was subjected to so much wear that it was deemed unsafe and closed to the public. Interestingly, the continuous research that we perform ahead of any intervention revealed that the stairway had been completely restored. In fact, it did not even exist. The original had been completely robbed and removed starting in the early Middle Ages. This image shows the first restoration, performed between 1870 and 1892, which recreated only a part of the stairway limited to the central strip. Afterwards, in 1912-1913, Dante Valieri decided to restore it completely in order to assure access to the anteroom and the cella and revive the lost monumentality of the city's largest temple. Our research allowed us to transform our actions into intelligent actions. We decided, naturally in coordination with the site director, to preserve this mimetic but nonetheless historical reconstruction. Therefore, we reset the loose slabs and filled in the gaps with the same materials.
confining awareness of the restoration to the site archives. These are some images of the repair in progress and an image of the completed project. From the very beginning, we have placed a lot of emphasis on so-called indirect conservation. Rather than acting directly on the object, one acts indirectly, attempting to protect it from environmental degradation processes. First and foremost, we have sought to revive the maintenance of the decorative elements in the site that had been guaranteed until not long ago, especially for the mosaics. We revived the seasonal coverage regimen instituted in the early 20th century, which called for all mosaics to be covered with sand before the onset of winter in early December and then uncovered in April in order to protect them from frozen rainwater. With these activities, we are testing new generation materials such as Gore-Tex or waterproof fabrics with high transpiration rates. Other very simple methods that we are testing include the installation of metal netting or the insertion of metal spikes on reset paintings to reduce the degradation caused by bird droppings. This image shows an example of improvements to the safety features along the principal visitor routes. One activity that we consider fundamental is the regular planned cleaning of the roofs, the monitoring and necessary cleaning and repairs of the surfaces and gutters of the modern protective coverings. Another very simple activity which I believe has contributed to the visitor's ability to navigate this forest of ruins is the repainting of the marble slabs created in the 1940s to indicate the names of streets and structures. The paint had faded and we took it upon ourselves to reapply it. A very humble but important activity which we use to maintain the proper appearance of the site is ordinary cleaning. Finally, we consider documentation of our work to be very important because it allows us to evaluate its effectiveness over time and to change our operational strategy as necessary. We believe that this documentation will be an important instrument in the future management of the site.